I'm slowly recovering. <laughs> I saw you out doing some helpful things, so I figured you must be uh, not new to this. Well, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still feeling it, but yeah. it's getting better.
Good morning. Nice to see all of you here this morning. Um, my name is Heather Kistner, and I'm a member of the board here at Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. We welcome you this morning. We welcome where you are on your journey. We welcome who you are and who you would like to be, and we're very, very happy that you chose um, this church to be a part of this morning for our morning service. Um, our COVID policy, you can direct yourself to the order of service. Um, and we really don't have any other announcements, announcements this morning. We would ask that you silence your cell phones and rest, take a breath, and we will join you in this morning's service. Thank you for being here. This experimental piece by Henry Cow uses dissonant tone clusters played by the whole hand or forearm. Uh, it's my best approximation to what a mystical, mystical experience with a moose might sound like. Uh, simultaneously awkward and elegant, dangerous and beautiful. In the Irish legend of Mananon, as told by John Varian, Mananon was the god of motion, and long before creation, he sent forth tremendous tides, represented by these tone clusters, which swept to and from through the universe and rhythmically moved the particles and materials of which the gods were later to make the suns and the worlds.
Our opening words come from Dag Hammershaw, who was Secretary General of the United uh, Nations and often said his work for peace was informed by spiritual experiences. He once wrote, God does not die on the day we cease to believe in a personal deity, but we die on the day when our lives cease to be illumined by the steady radiance renewed daily of a wonder, the source of which is beyond all reason. So let us enter into this time together so that we may be more radiant, more illuminated, more filled with wonder. Come, let us worship together. Join us in hymn number 92 in the gray hymnal, Mysterious Presence, Source of All. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. The response of reading. I, I, I just have a war with this microphone. I mean, <laughs> it's, on, uh, it's 531, and it's called uh, The Oversoul, and it's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. 
Let us learn the revelation of all nature and thought, that the highest dwells within us, and that the sources of nature are all in our own minds. I am constrained every moment to acknowledge a higher origin for events than the will I call mine. Every moment when the individual feels invaded by its memorial, it comes The soul's health consists in the fullness of its reception. Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related the eternal one. We flow to perfection, it is love. Well, since I'm still up here, <laughs> joy. It's good to see you all, and also those at home. I see the little red light is on, so it's over here now. I, um, let's see, I have a message from um, Suzanne Brown regarding her husband. I have an update on my husband's diagnostic journey with the um, malignant um, acetates. I hope I pronounced that right. But bottom line, um, on June 10th, Friday, a biopsy of the cancer uh, it will be taken of his GI tract. And he would appreciate he, that everyone would keep him in, his in their thoughts or prayers or meditations. And if you like, join us on Wednesdays as we meditate and send out good thoughts, healing light, um, just a pleasant opportunity to think of others and still be quiet. We do this online and it's fun. Um, I also like to um, remember um, 65 years of marriage. 60? Wow, congratulations. <laughs> Some people can't even make it six months. So it's good. Um, now is some time I could offer prayer and offer um, hope and offer belief that the world is not going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> um, so I would, but I, I, instead I'd like us to all be quiet and to just think and meditate on joy. What happened today, this morning, this moment, when you entered a building, someone you met, did you find or share joy? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Janetta. 
Um, this next song that we're going to sing for you is called There Are Numerous Strings in Your Lute. It goes on, let me add my own among them. Then when you smite your chords, my heart will break its silence and my heart will be one with your song. This song was written by Rabindranath Tagore around 1900 with harmonies added by Betsy Jo Angebrot in around mid-1900s. Uh, Rabindranath lived from 1861 to 1941. He was a Bengali poet, painter, composer, Nobel Prize winner, and teacher who founded his own university. He was active in educational and social reform in India. Rabindranath said, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. The poet W.B. Yeats studied Tagore's writings and the inspiration he gave to the people of India and all the people, the rest of the world. Yeats says that Tagore has been content to discover the soul and surrender himself to spontaneity, that he speaks with an innocence, a simplicity that makes the birds and the leaves seem as near to him as they are near to children and the season, changes of the seasons as great events. So as we pondered the choice of music that would highlight Chris's sermon topic, what do moose have to do with this mysticism, we decided to focus on mysticism and leave the moose insights to Chris. Um, so David found this beautiful song and he was eager to hear us sing it. We listened and we were captivated by the, its beauty and uh, we naively agreed we could easily learn it. Um, even though David expanded the tenor and bass lines, it has proven to be one of our most challenging efforts in that the harmonies are in fourths, sixths, ninths, not in the usual thirds and fifths. So many of us will hear this as a love song, which certainly can be a mystical experience. This song reflects our experience of singing together. So we invite you to lean into these lyrics and this musical experience to find your heart as one with the song, with the dance of service to each other, and with the loving smiles all around you. There are numerous strings in your lute. Let me add my own among them. Then when you smite your chords, my heart will break in silence, and my heart will be one with your song. There are numerous strings in your lute. Let me add my own among them. Amidst your numberless stars, let me place my own little lamb. There are numerous strings in your lute. Let me There are many reasons to give to the Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church, which were abundant this week. Uh, we had our religious education camp uh, 
and uh, the hallways were filled with kids and uh, I was in so many different rooms that it took me an hour to find my car keys at the end of the day and figure out where I, where I set them down. We were in so many different places, but they were helping to stock the food pantry, uh, helping in the garden, uh, doing social service. And uh, I just want to really uh, give a shout out to everyone who had a role in that. I invite you to give generously to the work of this church, and if you haven't had a chance to pledge yet to do so, we're having our congregational meeting coming up, and uh, if we know how much we can count on for next year, we can budget better and uh, support our staff better. And so I invite you to think about your favorite aspect of the church, whether it's build your own theology class or personal beliefs and commitments or a heart-to-heart -heart circle, some way that you personally connect and give generously. The ways to give are in the order of service, and if you're watching online, you can give through your own Realm account or text, uh, send a text message, send TVUUC an amount to 73256. And if you don't have a Realm account and you want to learn how to have a Realm account, uh, call the office and we can uh, work with you on that. So uh, think about your favorite part of our life together as a church and give generously. I first learned about uh, this um, instrument, the Aeolian Harps, um, historical context from this book, Machina Menta, The Thousand Year Quest to Build a Creative Machine. So uh, in the late 18th century, the Aeolian Harp was used like wind chimes. It was placed outside or in a wind's, window's draft, and it produced a ghostly effect. At the time, the Aeolian harp became a metaphor for theories of consciousness. Many believed that just as the harp made its own ghostly music as wind flowed through its strings, the neurons of our brains were similarly played by an ether that flowed through everything. Coleridge captured this popular idea in verse as he had a character ask the question, and what if all of animated nature be but organic harps, diversely framed, that tremble into thought as o'er them sweeps plastic and vast one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and the God of all. Oh, and if you're worried about the piano, it's going to be tuned tomorrow.
On my office shelves, there's a well-worn copy of the Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. I was uh, assigned to read it in theology school, but maybe you uh, were assigned. It's the classic text of psychology and religion. And that's what I want to talk about this morning is religious experience. But first, I want to talk about moose. And the reason is, if you've ever traveled in the Northeast, uh, in the state of Maine, uh, then you've probably seen signs that look something like this. Sign might say, Moose Crossing, or Beware of Moose in Roadway, or Break for Moose. A few summers ago, I was going up to a UU Conference Center, Ferry Beach, and I saw these signs everywhere I looked. But here's the thing, I never once saw a moose, and I wanted to see a moose, because we don't have those in Tennessee, and I thought it'd be great to see a moose. And as I was, you know, as I, the week ended and I was driving home, I thought to myself, I wonder what the ratio of sign to moose is. <laughs> Are there 10 signs for every one moose, or 100 signs for every one moose? That is the question. So this morning I want to invite us to consider the similarities between moose and religious experiences. For the religions of the world have produced many, many, many books that contain many, many, many words describing religious experience. And sometimes I wonder what the ratio of word to experience is. It seems like there's a lot more words out there than there are experiences. Words are plentiful and experience is rare. In the Zen tradition, they say that our, our words are like a finger pointing at the moon. They are not the moon itself. And yet sometimes the moon is below the horizon or the moon is behind clouds. And so... Um, to adapt that Zen teaching to the topic of this morning's sermon, our words are like road signs about moose. They are not moose itself. Now, Ralph Otto Emerson once warned against the dangers of secondhand testimony in religion, relying on someone else's testimony. He said, our age is retrospective. The foregoing generations beheld God face to face, we through their eyes. Why should we not have an original relationship to the universe? In other words, why should we rely on someone else's testimony, someone else's sign, instead of our own experience? Well, one reason to, to depend you know, rely on someone else's sign when it comes to moose instead of your own personal experiences because moose can be dangerous. Me and my friend David were once hiking in Yellowstone uh, Park and uh, we, we'd sort of read ahead and, you know, how to be in relationship with wildlife. And up ahead, there were 200 yards on the trail, there was a moose standing in the middle of the trail. And so we were doing what we're supposed to do. We're making noise. We're saying, hey, Mr. Moose. We're walking down the trail. We're not bothering you. You know, so, and we, we were still a pretty safe distance away, but the moose must have been deaf uh, because it didn't hear us until all of a sudden it went and started charging down the trail toward us. And without coordinating, David and I ran in different directions, which was a good decision because the moose just kept going down the trail uh, past where we were so um so it's good to rely on somebody's second you know that's my first hand experience that's your second hand experience but you know forewarned is forearmed so I prepare you for the possibilities hopefully this testimony will help prepare you for the moose itself if you're ever on a trail for similar reasons, I think it can be helpful to learn about religious experiences before we have one. Being forewarned a little bit can be helpful. For instance, when I served a congregation in Oxford, Ohio, there was a member of my uh, congregation who was a very uh, strong rationalist. 
and he often would make an argument that there was a rational explanation for everything. And so I wasn't really prepared when I went to see him in the hospital. He was going through some surgery, and I went into his hospital room, and I wasn't prepared when he told me about his out-of-body experience. I thought this, was, this guy was the least likely person to ever have an out-of-body experience, but he had an experience of seeing himself on the operation table as the surgeons were working on him, and he overheard their conversations, and later after the surgery, he asked the surgeons if, you know, if what he heard was what they said, and they said, yeah, that's, that is what happened. And so... Um, my friend did come up with a rational explanation for why that might happen. He, he figured that his unconscious mind heard it and created pictures for it. But here's the thing. He seemed a little less likely afterwards to dismiss other things as spiritual mumbo-jumbo and some, some kind of language, dismissive language he would use. There was something about the experience that... Uh, that made him a little more open to listening to other people's experience. Now, there's two aspects of this service, uh, uh, this story I want to lift up. One, my rationalist friend was completely unprepared for this experience. And two, I was completely un, uh, un, uh, not ready for him to have that experience. So, so it helps to have a little bit of forewarning, know what might be in the works. Of course, over the centuries, there have been many rational efforts to explain mystical experiences, the varieties of religious experience being an example of that. And William James wrote this book, and it's a collection of both firsthand accounts of experience and also sort of uh, uh, stories that are found in spiritual autobiographies uh, that have been written over, over the years. Now, these can be kind of like a road sign saying what might be ahead or it might not because, you know, the relationship to story, to experience is not necessarily a one-to-one -one experience. In the Unitarian Universalist Church, I sometimes think we're like, you know, two people driving down the road. One looks out the window and says, I see a moose. And the other looks out the other window and says, I don't see anything at all. We have different perspectives and different ways of looking, and there's room for all these different perspectives in our faith tradition. So William James documented how one person, this is one person's firsthand account, which I've adjusted for gender-inclusive language. Um, this one person reported feeling a presence one night that was fused with a central happiness. Happiness a startling awareness of some ineffable good. Afterwards, the memory persisted as the one perception of reality. In other words, this experience of the ineffable good was very fleeting, and yet it felt like it defined reality more powerfully than our day-to-day -day way of living. Another person wrote about an experience that happened at night she wrote, I remember the night where my soul opened out as it were into the infinite and there was a rushing together of two worlds, the inner and the outer, deep calling unto deep. It was like the effect of some great orchestra when all the separate notes are melted into one swelling harmony that leaves the listener conscious of nothing save that their own soul is being wafted upwards and almost bursting with its own emotion. Now, James mixes these firsthand uh, autobiographical ac accounts with some testimonies found in uh, ancient texts like the Theological Germanica, which describes a similar kind of experience, but in a way that helps prepare people for it, if, if it's going to happen. The Theological Germanica says, When we are enlightened by the true light, we renounce all desire and choice and commit and commend ourselves and all things to the eternal goodness. In this state, we experience freedom. We lose fear of pain or hell. We lose hope of reward or heaven. 
and live in pure submission to the eternal goodness. When we seek the eternal good and desire nothing but the eternal good. So this is one person's description of that experience. Now, William James uh, offers these testimonies, and sometimes people wrap these experiences in different languages. If you're Buddhist, you might wrap it in Buddhist language. If you're Christian, you might wrap it in Christian language or Jewish or any other different faith tradition. We tend to uh, borrow the language of our upbringing to describe these experiences, which are shared uh, across the lines of faith and culture. Another psychologist to, to study these kinds of experiences was Abraham Maslow, and he called these kinds of experiences, peak experiences. And he said they're common in such experiences to perceive the universe as an integrated and unified whole. The universe is all of one piece and that we have a place in it and we're part of it and we belong in it. The peak experience seems to lift us to a greater than normal height so we can perceive uh, in a higher than usual way. These peak experiences are ego transcending, self forgetful, and unselfish. A peak experience leads us away from fragmentation and polarization and division toward unity and wholeness and integration, we experience what he calls unitive consciousness, a sense of oneness, a sense of oneness. Now this morning I've spoken about religious experiences. However, I want to uh, uh, end by highlighting two different ways people have, have uh, interpreted the correct, you know, what is the way we respond to these kinds of experiences. Uh, one uh, tradition, uh, mystical tradition, says that uh, these kinds of experiences are used as a reason to retreat from the world. So, so go off and meditate somewhere and be private and alone as a dominant mode of your, of your life. However, in the Unitarian Universalist Church, we come out of that radical Reformation tradition where religious experiences empower us empower us to do work in the world, to work for social change, to work for social justice. For religious experiences can be fuel for action. Religious experiences can inspire us with a sense of unity and oneness and, and, and a desire to work for that unity and work for oneness in concrete ways. Along those lines, in, in an experience that Carl Jung would call synchronicity, uh, I was on my home page of the computer and uh, an article slash video popped up that read, Watch a mother moose protect her baby from a grizzly. Now, I don't remember ever having a video of a moose pop up on my home page before, and it it seemed like kind of an odd coincidence, so I clicked on it because I figured, this is sermon research. <laughs> and what I learned from that uh, video and some others, you know how it is, you click on one video and it suggests others. One of the things I've learned from that is grizzly bears are terrified of mama moose. Mama moose just has to start moving in the direction of that grizzly bear, and that grizzly bear runs off as fast as the grizzly bear can. Mama Moose starts coming that way, and that grizzly bear becomes a frady cat. Has no pride at all. Running away. And I mentioned that. I mentioned that because I believe all the varieties of religious experience, every single one, every single one, should fill us with a fierce determination to defend the young people in our lives. In the aftermath of the violent events in Robb Elementary School in Texas and the supermarket in Buffalo and the church in California and the hospital in Tulsa 
and last night in Philadelphia and in, in recent times in the neighborhood around Austin East High School and the list goes on and on and on. We need religious experiences that awaken the mama moose in us. There have been 239 mass shootings in the United States this year, and it's only June. It's only June. And one of the organizations doing the most to stop this trend is Moms Demand Action. So I invite you to consider joining that organization and working for change. This week I learned about Angeli Rose Gomez, the mother of two kids in Robb Elementary School. The police handcuffed her and somehow she was able to talk them out of the handcuffs and then jump the fence and go into the school and escort her two kids safely out of the elementary school while the police were still trying to figure out what to do. And I also learned about the Girl Scouts giving a posthumous award to a Mary Joe Garza, a 10-year-old girl. She was awarded the Bronze Cross for uh, giving her life to save others or attempting to save others. I do not know Angeli or Amira's religion, if they had one at all, but I do believe their examples can help us challenge our religious experiences so there is no need for this kind of heroism in the future. So there's no need for this kind of heroism in the future. As the old activist saying says, I'd rather be a guardrail at the top of the hill than an ambulance at the bottom. For religious experience can give us the courage to face our fear and the energy to take risks. Religious experience can empower us to action for the most profound religious experiences are not the ones we read about in the book. The most profound religious experiences are the ones that transform our lives and by transforming our lives, transform the world. And if you've never had one before, don't say, I didn't warn you. Join us in singing hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses.
Prophetic Church, the world awaits your liberating ministry. Go forward in the power of love. Proclaim the truth that makes us free. watching online, I invite you to our virtual coffee hour. If you're in the room, I invite you to come to our, our coffee hour in person. Uh, we'll, uh, leaders will be spread out in different places. I'll be outside greeting people outside. So as our last act of worship, I invite you to turn and greet your neighbor.